last time. That was my biggest fan and my uh, truth indicator. So anytime I said something good, she said, yeah. If I said something not good, she said, yeah. So uh, anyway, so she did. All right. Um, so the last time, uh, what I started was uh, the Eastern approach to hope and healing. And the last time, uh, what I did was the Hindu principles that would help us in, uh, you know, in our own hope and healing, and help us in our own uh, personal uh, life and our spiritual pathway. So today, I say I I, I plan to do uh, the Buddhist uh, pathway to hope and healing. <clears throat> now, of course, Buddhism was based on Hinduism, and. Um, and if you don't know too much about Buddhism, you know, like uh, they say, <clears throat> between the age of 12 and 30, nobody knows where Jesus was. Apparently, he was in India in a Buddhist monastery. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of those myths. <laughs> okay, then he came back and he taught Buddhism. No. So, uh, but I like the Buddhist pathway because it's not a religion, it's a spiritual path. Um, one of the things, uh, about the Buddha is this. The Buddha was born a Hindu. So he was born in a Hindu family. He was part of the caste system. He was the son of a king. And when he was born, his father brought several soothsayers to look at the child and predict his future. So they all looked at the child. I don't know what, where they looked, but they all said the same thing except one of them. All of them said, this child will either be a great king or a great ascetic. But there was one guy who says, he'll only be a great ascetic. So his father, who was a king, wanted him to follow in his tradition, protected the Buddha from all the pain in this world and the pains of life. And so he was surrounded by luxury, comfort, and a non-pain non you know, way of life. But Buddha gets out of the palace one time, and he has four, he sees four passing sights that set him on a different path and a different journey. So the first sight that he saw was an old person. So he said, oh, so I'm not going to be young all my life. What is this old age about? Then he, he, he moves along and then he sees a sick person. So he encounters sickness. Then he, then he finds a person who has died. So that becomes one of his new uh, kind of experiences. And then he has the fourth sight, and that is the sight of a bhikshu, who is an ascetic, who is free in the midst of all this pain and suffering. And so that set the Buddha thinking about life. What is life all about? Okay? Now the last time there was someone who asked me a question about pain and suffering. Are you here? Oh, okay. So, you're going to get the answer. <laughs> and I said I would talk about it today. So, yes, so the Buddha decided to reflect on the pain and suffering in life. And so he goes away. First he tries the path of all the scholars. So he went through all the scholars, all the schools, he learned as much as he could, but he couldn't find peace. And he couldn't find his answer. Then he went and he, out, he outdid his masters in their learning, okay? And I'm sure that is true of some of you, if not most of you and all of you sitting over here. You're moving from one lecture to another lecture, one speaker to another speaker, one book to another book, one school to another school, one degree to another degree. For what? Trying to get knowledge, trying to get wisdom, and trying to find your inner peace and freedom. So when he... And uh, when, when he did finish that, he couldn't find his satisfaction. He joined five uh, like ascetics who tried the path of penance. So he did all the penance possible 
to find enlightenment, but even, even that did not satisfy him. So in his, in his quest for that inner peace and inner freedom, he goes and he sits in meditation in Bodh Gaya under the, the, you know, the pipal tree or the, or, the, or the banyan tree, but that's a tree where he sits in meditation. He gives up all that wisdom, all the learning, he gives up all the ascetic practices and he sits in meditation and he comes out enlightened. And his enlightenment was now to follow the middle path. Not this extreme, not that extreme, but a middle path is what will, you know, give him his peace and his happiness. So, when, he, when he's enlightened, he has two options. One, he says, I can die now and pass on to the next life, or I can continue to live and share this enlightenment experience with the rest of the world. So he decided to, to, uh, to share his wisdom with the rest of the world. Which was the first group that he went to? The group that had disowned him. The group that looked at him with disdain. The ascetics. He said, you're a wimp. You're useless. You're hopeless. You couldn't last. So when he goes away, like in, when, when he's enlightened, guess what? He comes back to these guys in the deer park and he preaches his first sermon on the four noble truths. What's the first noble truth? Life is suffering. Suffering has a cause. The cause of suffering is craving and attachments. And there's a path out of suffering and that is the Eightfold Path. The Eightfold Path. Okay? Now, the cause of, like, so life is suffering. Now, one of the things that the Buddha's enlightenment gave him was that suffering is an option. Pain is a fact of life. Suffering is a choice. So pain is a fact of life. All of us go through pain. All of us experience pain. There is no life without pain. You know, so pain is part of life. But, and here's what the Buddha, the Buddha said. Pain that is resisted becomes suffering. Pain that is not resisted always purifies and enlightens. So pain that is resisted becomes suffering. Pain that is not resisted always purifies and enlightens. You know, take the pain of anything. Some of you have already heard me say this, you know, and uh, like let's say the pain of a broken relationship. Let's see the pain of somebody being unfaithful, of someone cheating, or a person just dies. Is that painful? Very painful. But what's the enlightenment? What's the gift in this wonderful, not, it's not wonderful, in this painful experience? What is the gift? So if you go through the pain, you realize that when someone loves you, they do not make you happy. When someone loves you, they do not make you happy. They make you aware of the source of your happiness that is within you. And so, if somebody dies, cheats, goes away, they don't take your happiness with them. Your happiness stays with you. Because I'll repeat once again the experience of one of my students. As soon as class was over, she runs to her boyfriend and tells him, you don't make me happy. <laughs> And the poor guy, his face fell, and he asked the obvious question, so why do you stay with me? And she said, well, because you love me, I'm able to accept all the good qualities that I have, and I'm growing in my good qualities. Because you love me, I'm able to accept the, the, the weaker parts of my personality, you know, my weaknesses, and I can still feel beautiful. And she said, I hope I'm doing the same thing for you. 
but you do not make me happy. So she said, if anything happens to this relationship, it will be very, very painful, but you're not taking my happiness with you. Now that is big. Because people often say, you know, if you leave me, I'll die. Because nobody really dies. We all recover. My, my mother died 12 years before my father did, and he said, oh dear, he's going to die soon. No, he lived for 12 years. Not because he didn't love my mother, but because he loved my mother, he lived those 12 years in love with her. And, like, you know, being a good father and being a good grandfather, he lived a wonderful life. So we kind of, you know, we often say, yeah, you know, if, um, and you know, we also need to think about this whole wonderful phenomenon of love. You know, I think we have an illusion of love. If you love me, I will die. If you love me, I will, devast I will be devastated. Uh, you know the story of the guy, of that couple that was very much in love with like, you know, with one another. And every mother that had a teenage child would bring the teenage child and point to that couple. Look at them. You have to kind of model their life. And, but one day, the man died. And of course, the poor woman was devastated. And people went out to her to, con you know, to offer her condolences and sympathy. And one young guy went there a little too often and the infection set in. He fell in love with her. She fell in love with him. And by the way, when she died, when he died, she had put on his tombstone, on his gravestone, the light of my life is gone. The light of my life is gone. So teenage mothers who had teenage kids would take, take a walk through the cemetery and stop at the tombstone to talk about what a wonderful relationship they had. But when they fell in love and they wanted to get married, that tombstone became an embarrassment. So they went to their priest, who luckily for them was a wise Jesuit. <laughs> because they asked him to change that tombstone. And he said, oh no, you have written the light of my life, my life is gone. Just add another line to say, I've struck another match. <laughs> so, of course there are people who strike other matches even before the light is gone. But, but what the Buddha offers, what the Buddha offers in this painful, painful, painful situation, life experience, is to look at the gift. You don't lose yourself. You may lose a relationship, but you do not lose yourself. Okay? Let's take another painful experience that is really painful and devastating. Sexual abuse. When a person has been sexually abused, is it painful? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Okay? I've met people who have kind of gone through these experiences, and I know what the pain is. I mean, I know that... I think I know. It's like, you know, I'm thinking about the bishop who was in the hospital, you know, visiting the hospital, and he was visiting this woman. And he told her, he says, you know, I understand your pain, and I know what your pain is like. And the woman said, really? Have you ever had a hysterectomy? <laughs> <laughs> well, well it's, no, I understand pain from the way people have told me, you know. So, uh, so yes, so people who have been abused, it is painful. But one of the things I try to help them, you know, in spiritual direction and trying to help them to work through it, not to work around it, to work through it, what's the gift? That, that sexual abuse abused your body, not your person. Does it make it less painful? No. It does not make it less painful painful. But the hope, the gift, the enlightenment is I can still find myself even in the most abusive situations. So I don't lose my soul. I don't lose myself. I can find the gift of who I am 
even in abuse. You know, Mahatma Gandhi, when the British, he told the British, you can break my body, but you cannot touch my spirit. That's free. My spirit is free. So even in that physical pain, even in, you know, all the other abuse, the spirit is still free. Now, it is easier said than done, but that's where our hope is. That's the gift that the Buddha offers us. So, um, so a pain that is resisted becomes suffering. Pain that is not resisted always purifies and enlightens. Um, you know people who, you know, when they're told they've got six months to live, my godmother died of cancer. No, she didn't die of cancer, she died of by cancer, or you know, it was cancer that she had, and, and anyway, so when she when she was told that she had cancer, that she had cancer, she went through all those stages of denial, anger, bargaining, depression. But when she came out of that depression, she became the best person that I've ever known. She lived life like she'd never lived before. You know, she came back. She came down to India. First of all, in those days, there were no emails. It was just those long mails. You know, the, 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 the regular mail that came down, and she said, cancer. And she was my mother's younger sister, my favorite aunt, my godmother. Of course, when she, we heard cancer, that was another word for death. We knew she was not going to live. Okay, it broke our hearts. We were all crying. And then she said, I'm coming down for Christmas. And we said, uh oh. Here we're going to get like a dead body, you know, a corpse coming because cancer. She came down and not for a moment did any one of us think that she, had, she was going to die. Because she was the life of, her, of the whole family. She wanted to go and visit family members, friends, go out to dinners, visit places. Not a moment did we see, did we see her sad or depressed. And I asked her, what is your secret? Of course, she told me once she came out of a depression, she made only one prayer. She said, I did not pray to God for a, to cure me. I pray that God will find a cure for cancer so that people who come after me can profit from that cure. But the only prayer that I prayed for myself was, I want to live one day at a time and live as fully as I can. To live one day at a time and to live as fully as I can. And she did. You know, she went back, and that was, uh, uh, and she said she was going to come back the following year. She did not. So she went back, went back to work, and she was doing everything one day at a time, as fully as she could. And one day she was on the telephone talking to her best friend. And I heard this from her husband, you know. She was talking to her best friend and saying, I think my time to die has come. The poor man, as soon as she put the phone down, picked her up, put her in the cab, rushed her to the hospital. And while, she was, while he was wheeling her into the emergency room there, she stopped him, gave him you know, all the gold that she had, and asked him to bring a pen and a paper. Now you think she's going to dictate her last will and testimony? No. She was thinking about him and the little kids. He didn't know how to cook. So she began to dictate simple recipes in the emergency room. <clears throat> and while dictating recipes, she died. I envy her. I envy her. Where did she get the gift? Cancer. Sickness. She knew her time was short and limited. And decided to live as fully as she could. You know. And who has promised you and me? length of days. You remember the guy who went to the hospital for a, to see the doctor and calls up from the doctor's office to his wife and he's crying. And his wife said, honey, what happened? He said, well, he says, the doctor's given me like bad news. He says, what's the bad news? He says, he's given me a tab. He says, I have to take this pill, one pill a day for till the rest of my life. For the rest of, and the doctor, and the wife said, that's okay, honey. I know a lot of people that take one pill a day, so what's the big deal? He says, he's given me only ten. <laughs> so, 
<laughs> All right. You and I have a hundred, maybe we have a thousand, but it's not unlimited. The time is going to come when you and I are going to die. So, let's live. Again, here's the day, here's another wisdom of the Buddha. Part of the Buddhist tradition is, you know, they have this little, the story of this little bird. So the Buddhists always carry a little bird on their shoulder. And they talk to that bird. I mean, I talk to my birds and nobody's looking at me or nobody's around me. <laughs> but otherwise, the Buddhists have this little bird that they talk to all the time. And they say, little bird, is it going to be today that I'm going to die? Little bird, am I living my life as fully as I can? Little bird, am I doing everything that I'm supposed to be doing? You know? So that little bird, and when the little bird says, not today, then you wake up and you live the best way you can live because you have another day to live the meaning of your life, to live the purpose of your life. Okay? So, yes, every one of us needs to carry the little bird on our shoulder and ask the little bird, is it going to be today? You know, one of the Buddhists were asked, what is the secret of your life? He said, every morning I wake up with the thought that today might be but the last day of my life. And they told him, they said, but doesn't everybody think that way? He said, yes, but I believe it at the core of my being. So I believe it at the core of my being every morning that this might be my last day. And so when I know this is going to be my last day, I'm going to live as fully as I can. So that is part of, like in a Buddhist wisdom, pain that is resisted becomes suffering. Pain that is not resisted always purifies and enlightens. And you can apply that to like a thousand other things. In any painful situation, look for the wisdom. Now I might, you'll come and tell me, you know, I'm in this situation, please tell me, what's the wisdom? I don't know. You can find it out yourself. I can tell you. I can suggest. But until it sits right with you, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You know, one time a woman came to the Buddha, and these are stories. You know, they may be true, they may not be true, but they're there to make a point. And her child had died. And he, she, she came and told the Buddha, Please help me, bring my child back. And the woman said, sure, but on one condition. Go to all the homes, wherever you want, and find a home that has not experienced pain from someone dying, and bring a mustard seed from that home, and I will revive your child. So of course the woman went to every home for days, for weeks, for months. And every family, yes, there was the pain of someone that we loved who died. So that again is part of life. There's a gift. Now, again, since we know that our loved one is going to die, you know, sometimes like, I don't know, there's this other Remember the guy who went to the cemetery every day and he would cry at his grave and say, why did you go so soon? Why did you go so soon? And he was like sobbing and crying. And they came and asked him, they saw him, they said, who died? It's like, you know, did your child, your mother? They said, no. They said, okay, tell us. You come here every day and you're saying, why did you go so soon? Why did you go so soon? He said, well, my wife's previous husband. No. So, <laughs> it could work the other way around too. So. <laughs> so, but we all know, we all know that we are going to die, okay? Or my loved one is going to die. My parents are going to die. My spouse is going to die. My children are going to die. I'm going to die. I don't know when. So, how about enjoy them while you have them? Enjoy them as if this were the last day, the only day that you had with them. You know? So, like, value that time, because when the time comes, 
you won't regret it. My, both my parents have died. I don't miss them at all. My students get like scandalized when I tell them that. No, why do I not miss them? Because I knew that they were going to die sometime or the other, so I spent quality, quality time with them for many days, weeks, and months of my life. You and I still have the time to spend time with our loved ones. So when the time comes to die, we know this is part of, part of life. My Sanskrit teacher, when his wife died, the next day he came to class and he was teaching as if this was another day and another class. And of course we were 11, you know, uh, Jesuits went running to him to offer condolences. Why? Because we've been trained in the Western, like, culture, where you offer condolences, sympathy. But when we went there, we realized that in Indian language, there is no word for sympathy and condolences. No, you don't offer sympathy, and you don't offer condolences, because this is part of life. It's part of life. Death is a part of life. And so therefore, when it happens, they are not surprised. And so my Sanskrit teacher says, he, tell, he told us, oh, she died, and we had this, uh, you know, the puja, and the ceremony, and now we, uh, on, the th on the third day and the 40th day, we're going to have all of this. And he said, okay, and went back to class. And he continued to teach, as if this was another. So he knew, day one, when they got married, that one of them was going to die. So he lived every day, every day, as fully as he could with his beloved, that when the time came to die, he was teaching. He continued to teach. Now that's a bit of an extreme. <laughs> I'm not recommending that, but, you know, because we are not the Sanskrit teacher and the Sanskrit professor, you know, but, how long are you going to grieve? Why are you so surprised? And what's the pain? What's the suffering? Pain, yes. The pain that you're going to miss. The pain that you know it's going to be different. That pain, yes. But what's the gift? You know, the gift is, again, we also say that death is the end of a life, not a relationship. Death is the end of a life, not a relationship. The relationship continues. In fact, after a person dies, that relationship grows even more. Now, don't wake up and tell your spouse, "Please die, so we can, <laughs> so that we can grow in our relationship." Because <laughs> somehow we are stuck. No. So anyway, no. But when a person and when a loved one, when people that we love really, when they die, you know, it's the end of a life, but not a relationship. Somehow they resurrect. It's the resurrection. They, they rise to a new level, to a new way, to a deeper and a freer way, if we are only willing to see it. It's like Mary Magdalene, through the tears in her eyes, she recognized the rainbow in her heart, where she found Jesus, in a different way, in a different form, in a different relationship. And then she wanted to hold on to him. And what did Jesus say? Don't cling to me. I'm free now. You're free now. Let's live. You know, again, I cannot help but think about my parents. Like my mother died 12 years before my father did, as I told you. In the first year, he went every day to the cemetery and prayed the rosary at her grave and talked to her. Then he would come home and talk to her. And then he asked me one time, he says, am I going crazy or what? I talk to your mother all the time. And I said, Dad, Mom's physically gone, but she's very much alive in you, in me, and in all of us. It's not only okay, but it's good. It's very good. And then years later, my father kind of, you know, I mean, we had a wonderful... I feel blessed that my father, my mother, and we are able to talk freely about what things about things that really matter. 
you know. Uh, so he told us, he said, you know, about a year ago, so he said, I haven't seen your mother in a whole year. But about a year ago, she walked through the front door. She walked through the front front door, and she had this beautiful dress on, and she looked beautiful, and she was smiling. And she told me, I'm very, very happy, and I want you to be happy too. And then she disappeared, and he never saw her again. And he asked me, he said, what was that all about? And of course, you know, I had to pull out something from <laughs> the first time when I tried to answer his question. He asked me when my mother died, you know, will I be with her? Will she? I said, well, he said, don't even try <laughs> because you haven't been on the other side. He was very Buddhist. What did the Buddha say about death? Somebody asked him, what will happen to me after I die? And he said, why are you asking this question? Is it just a philosophical question? Or do you really want to know? Because if you really want to know, we can arrange for you to die. <laughs> so you can find out. So, but when my father told me about my mother, who appeared and then disappeared, I gave him, of course, an African story and a myth. Like, if you want to tell a lie and make up a story, just say it happened in Africa. Nobody knows. <laughs> so, but this is a story about one of the African tribes. And I do believe it's also part of the Native American, but I'm not sure. You know, but it, what they say is, when a person dies, the ultimate goal is to go, uh, to be with all the elders of the tribe. But they don't go there right away. There is a time when after they die, they hang between people on this earth and the elders. And we've got to work out our emotional bonds with them. They with us and we with them. And once we've worked out those bonds and we feel comfortable, like my mother said, you know, I'm very happy and I want you to be happy. She went back to the elders and now they become a source of blessing to the whole tribe. And of course my sister said, like, why didn't you tell us that before? I said, I don't even know if it is true. But you know, what I'm saying is, no, I don't, who knows? Who knows? When we die, we'll find out. But it's a, something good to hold on to, hold on to, to say, yes, when people die. You know, those of us who kind of, uh, you know, who are close to us who have died, a time will come when you feel guilty because you cannot even remember what your mother looked like. You know, the face becomes blurry, your father's face, and then you've got to look at pictures to say, oh, this is how mom looked like. Because if you're not looking at photographs, the pictures become blurry, but the person becomes more real and more alive. You know, somehow like those faces fade away, but the person, the reality, the relationship never dies. <coughs> Okay, so, yes, so, for the Buddhists, live life every day as fully as you can. Ask the little bird on your shoulder, is it today that I'm going to die? Am I living my life as fully as I can? Am I living the meaning and the purpose of my life? Wake up every morning thinking that this might be the last day. How would you live that life? How would you live that day? And live it in that freedom and in the fullness. You know, like my godmother. Live till she died. Why? Because she had cancer. And by the way, pain that is resisted becomes suffering. So when people have cancer, please don't fight the cancer. Because you'll always lose. The Buddhists teach us to journey with the cancer because in the journey there are gifts. In the journey there's enlightenment. In the journey there's peace and freedom. In the journey there's power. There's power. Remember that line of St. Paul. Power is made perfect in weakness. Physical, spiritual, emotional, weakness, 
power is made perfect. All right, so life is suffering. Suffering has a cause. What is the cause of suffering? Craving and attachment. So we crave for good things and we try to get rid of other things. So pain, we try to get rid of pain and we try to hold on to joy and pleasure. For the, for the Buddhists, you do not cling to either one or the other. You know, when, when today you're up, be happy. Tomorrow you're down, still be, don't lose your bliss, don't lose your inner peace. Okay, so when we, have, when we hold on to good things, it's not good. It's not good. If you hold on to bad things, it's not good. We need to be able to let go of good and, and pain. The painful and the pleasurable, like live with it. You've got to be like Mary. See, Mary in the Gospel was a great Buddhist. Of course, she's probably from India, you know, because <laughs> when the angel said, you know, will you bear hail full of grace? God has found favor with you. Will you bear God's son? Did she say yes? No. Did she say no? No. What did she do? She just bobbled ahead. <laughs> she said, let it be done. Let it be done to me according to God's word. Let it be done to me according to God's word. So good things happen. They're shouting, Hosanna. Mary is there. She's there taking in the Hosannas. But she doesn't cling to it. Now they are shouting, crucify him, crucify him. She's there. Experiences the pain of rejection. Experiences the pain of the crucifixion. But she does not cling to it. She's still standing at the foot of the cross. You know, her heart is broken, but not her spirit. As a mother, she's crying. But her spirit never gives up. Her spirit is free, you know. So she doesn't cling to the, to, the, to the cross. She doesn't cling to the hosannas. Now she is ready for the resurrection. And even at the resurrection, Jesus says, do not cling to me. Don't cling. Don't hold on to. Like flow. Good things happen, flow with it. Bad things happen, flow with it. Okay? Uh, you've broken your arm, right? Yes, yeah, so I... I was thinking about this Chinese story, you know, the Chinese story about the guy who, you know, the Chinese farmer who had a horse that he would use to plow the field and support his family and take care of everything and one day the horse runs away. And of course that's his only means of livelihood. And all the neighbors come and say, oh, what bad luck. You know the story. Like, how many of you know the story? Good. <laughs> so. <laughs> So I'll tell it to you quickly. So the horse runs away and everybody says, oh, what bad luck. But about a week later, the horse comes with a whole group of other wild horses. And all the neighbors come and say, oh, the first time. When they say, what bad luck, the farmer says, good luck, bad luck, who knows. You know. Now a lot of these horses come. All the, all the neighbors come and say, what good luck. And he says, good luck, bad luck, who knows. Of course, a week later, his son is riding one of the wild horses, falls down and breaks his leg and breaks, hurts himself just like you, okay? And all the neighbors come and say, what bad luck? And, he's, and he says, good luck, bad luck, who knows? Of course, a week later, war breaks out and they are kind of, you know, all the young men have been enlisted, but this guy cannot go because he's, he's and all the farmers and the neighbors come and say, good luck, bad luck, who knows? So this is the Buddhist way of living with life. It's not being fatalistic. It's not being just resigned. Buddhism, by the way, is a very active kind of, uh, uh, you know, it's like you, you cannot, you have to think. You've got to figure out. Things are not just given to you. You know, just by reading books and following gurus, nothing happens until you get it into yourself. So you've got to figure things out yourself. You've got to struggle with pain of life. You've got to find your answers. You've got to work with attachment and detachment. 
You know, by the way, what causes attachment? You know, my, if you've read my books and you've heard me before, I'll say it once again. We are attached to those people, places, and things we do not fully enjoy. Let me say it again for those of you who are hearing me for the first time. We are attached to people, places, and things we do not fully enjoy. If you've enjoyed something, you want to share it with the rest of the world. If you enjoy something, if something happens so it's taken away from you, you've enjoyed it. You don't miss it because you're not attached to it. So the way of overcoming attachment is by enjoying what you have. Material things, relationships, places, enjoy them and say goodbye. Say goodbye. Okay? Um, so, all right. So the, the Buddhist way is to be able to struggle to find your own wisdom. Your own wisdom. You know, that's why, what, what is the Buddha saying? If you see the Buddha, kill him. If you see the Buddha, kill him. Why? Because what were the last words of the Buddha? You know, his favorite disciple, Ananda, they sent him to the Buddha and said, give us your last words of wisdom. First of all, when the Buddha was dying, there is again, this is another myth, an angel appeared to the Buddha and said, you know, I'm ready to grant you a gift. How long do you want to live? God says, you can live as long as you want. And without pausing, the Buddha says, 80 years. And all his disciples said, Buddha, why didn't you ask for hundreds of years? You know, you could have lived. And the Buddha said, if I asked for many years, people would be interested in living a long life, quantity, not quality. So 80. My father told us years before he died that he was going to die when he was 86. Why not 100 for him? 86. So he died at the peak of his life. 86 in that year, not on his birthday, but in that year he died. So the Buddha said, so the last words, they said, give us your last words of wisdom. And he says, O Ananda, be lamps unto yourself. Be a lamp unto yourself. Don't look outside. Don't even believe what I say. But look into your heart and find the wisdom. Find the answers. Find your own path within you. And I say this to you too. Don't believe a word of what I'm saying. Hold, and I tell my students too. Don't, you know, but hold, hold on to your convictions as strongly as you can. But be open. Be open. I prefer that some peop uh, people have convictions that are just the opposite of what I have than someone who has no convictions at all. I give my students who have written papers that are diametrically opposite of what I believe. If they can write a logical paper, they get A's in my class. In fact, if they disagree with me, I admire them even more. Because, you know, so, but anyway, so the, so Buddhism, so the Buddhism and hope and healing is not fatalistic. It's not kind of saying, okay, whatever. No, it's not whatever. It is whatever because I found the essence of life. What is the essence of life? Here's the other saying of the Buddha. This is a legend, of course. There's a saying that, you know, when the Buddha was two years old, he pointed his finger to the sky and he said, in all the world, I alone exist. Let me say this again and explain this. In all the world, I alone exist. What is the I? It's not the me. The I is the eternal essence. It's the eternal I. It's the eternal, you may call God. But I told you, I don't like the word God because it limits God. There is God beyond God. There is the divine essence. There is that. That 
you know. And that, the divine essence, is in every creature, and that's the only thing that exists. That is real. That is real. This me, this body, will die. You know, the, the, my, the material things that I have, I leave behind. A U-Haul truck never follows a hearse. So we leave all our material things behind you. And those of you who have heard me before, you know, when you die, your children and grandchildren will have a garage sale of all the things that you treasure so much, and they will not even sell over there, you know. They probably end, end in the thrift shop or in a dumpster somewhere. So, you know, so material things is not me, is not who I am. My degrees, my thinking, my feelings, my friend, all these things are passing. It's not real. It's not real. Okay, there's only one real thing. Because one of the, what is one of the main Buddhist principles? Anicca, 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 which is transiency. Everything is transient. Everything is changing. You never step into the same river twice. The river is different and you are different. So there is, a, life is changing. Life is transient. You know, I tried to look up the dictionary or the, I went on the, Indian, uh, on the internet to look for transience, you can't find it. You know, you look for that word, it's like, it doesn't exist because we think this is permanent. Everything is permanent, everything is. No, we've got footprints in the rain, not footprints in the sand. Even footprints in the sand will stay there for a little bit. Footprints in the rain, there are no footprints in the rain, that's life. It's transient. Anicca, anicca, anicca. Nothing is permanent. Everything is changing. There's only one thing that doesn't change. I, the divine, the essence, that doesn't change. And even if you wanted to, you cannot change it. So in all the world, I alone exist. <coughs> and I'm going to repeat what I said the last time. Another Buddhist thing about so who am I? Who am I? Uh, remember the story of the little wave? Those of you who were last time, how many of you remember that story of the little wave? Good. So I'll tell it to you again. <laughs> the others who were not here. So the story, this is the Buddhist story. So the Buddhist story of the little wave is, you know, there's all these waves dancing on the, on, the, on the ocean, and all of a sudden they're coming to the shore. And this little wave panics. Panic, and they're screaming. And all the other waves are saying, what's your problem? And the wave says, can't you see? We're going to crash. We're going to die. We are all going to die. And the bigger waves say, oh, little wave, you're not just a little wave. You're part of the ocean. Isn't that beautiful? You and I are not just little waves. We are part of the ocean of God's love and God's life. In all the world, I alone exist. Because I'm not just a little wave. I'm part of the ocean. That's Buddhism. That gives me hope. That gives me healing. That gives me the freedom to be able to live my life as fully as I can. Okay? Uh, I'll go quickly through. So the, the four paths, the four noble truths are, you know, like... Life is suffering, suffering is a cause. The cause of suffering is attachment and desires. And there's a way out of suffering. And the way out of suffering is the eightfold, uh, the eightfold path. So the eightfold path is the middle way. And the eightfold path is divided into three sections. What is the first section? Panna. Panna is wisdom. And wisdom comes from the right view and the right intention. So the right view of life. So I need to look at life as life is. Not the way I'm told and not the way I would like it to be. So the right view is of life is everything is transient. Nitya anitya vastu viveka. So there is nitya anitya. So nitya is that which changes. 
Anitya is that which never changes. So there is an eternal principle, the I, and everything else changes. Okay, so the right view. The right view is finding that I'm part of the ocean, and so are you, and so are you, and so is everybody. So whatever happens to one of us affects the rest of us. That is the right view. Now when I have that right view, I'm careful about you know, being more compassionate towards people, you know, being understanding towards people, as often as I can. I'm not saying I'm perfect all the time. Sometimes I feel like a little wave. I'm going to crash. I'm going to crash. No, out of the ocean. When I get that. So that's the right view. You know, finding the essence. <clears throat> Who am I? And what is life all about? Finding my identity in the divine essence, interconnectedness of all of life, because in all the world, I alone exist. The divine essence is in every creature. I told you we in India always believe that, but you call us pantheists. And when Ignatius, said, Ignatius says that the more enlightened, the more the, the more the more developed, like you know, the more uh, people who have gone developed in their in their in their spiritual life will constantly contemplate and, and meditate how God our Lord is present in every creature by his power, presence, and essence. So the divine essence, according to Saint Ignatius of Loyola, is in every creature. Of course, when he says that he becomes a mystic, when we say we are pantheists. But, you know, it's the same thing. It's the same reality. You know, that's what the Buddhists believe. That's what the Hindus believe. That's what, that is what the truth is all about. That's what the Native Americans believe. That's why they have this reverence and this connection for nature, for life. You know, for, 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 for everything. You know, so when, of course, when they were trying to grab their land to say, this is our land. They were shocked. They said, how can the land belong to you? We belong to the land. Land cannot belong to anybody. You know, land cannot belong to anybody. So, uh, so the right view of life, the right view. Then you have the right intention or the right thinking. Right thinking or right intention. So if it is, if I'm doing the psychology, that using this in psychology, I would use this for right thinking is, my thinking creates emotions that triggers behavior. So if I have to change my behavior, I've got to change not my emotions, but my thinking, my thought. But I like to take, you know, for the Buddhists, intention, intention, intention is extremely important. I told you that was a gift that my Native American friend gave me the last time. I was with him yesterday, and he gave me two other principles. He just talks, you know. And when I'm ready, I listen. And I take what, I, what, what I'm ready for. Yesterday he talked about diligence. I said, oh, I can, I can know. It, it'd take me another lifetime to be diligent the way he expressed <laughs> diligence in life, you know. And the other thing, this other principle was, whatever you do, whatever decisions you make, make it in favor of life, not death. Make it in favor of goodness, not, you know. So anyway, that's for another, for, for another day. So the intention, intention is important. Like if I'm doing these wonderful presentations because I want you to say, oh, what a wonderful person Paul is, bad intention. I've gone down to the Merrimack today, you know, before I came here. And I did a little ritual, what you have at Mass which is such a beautiful, powerful ritual, among many other rituals at the Mass. You know, before, of course, now we do it in automatic, but the Gospel, you know, you kind of, you sign your forehead, your lips, and your heart. Remember that? Yes. You go to church, I love it. I do that all the time. I went into the water, and I sign myself, to purify my mind, my lips, and my heart. So I don't come in the way of the spirit trying to reach out to people that I'm going to minister to during the day. Over here, afterwards, you know, I'm not perfect, but I like the purification of the mind, the lips, and the heart. So it's a purification where the intention, again, is not about me, 
But the intention is getting that me out of the way so that the Spirit of the Lord, so the Spirit of God, so that the Divine Spirit might kind of flow out to people. Now, what happens on the other side is none of my business. You know, when I, in the beginning, I used to feel, yeah, I'm preaching and teaching all for the kingdom of God. And I want everybody to, not for me, but for the kingdom of God. Until I realized what a big burden that was. And I told God, I said, that's your baby. And that works also for, as for you as parents. It's too big a burden to feel responsible for your children. I don't know whether this makes sense to you. You do the best that you can in messing up the lives of your children. <laughs> because every parent does it out of love. They never do it. Never do it the way their parents did it to them. But you know, you have your own way. And you do it out of the goodness of your heart. You do it out of love. You do the best as you can and then let go. Let go. What happens on the other side now is between your child and God. But it's not easy because you still feel that connection. You still feel responsible. No, you're not. Those children are given to you as a gift on loan. Until they become, they become teenagers. Then you say, yes, yes, you're on loan. Get out. <laughs> so, so no, but you know what? But it's not easy. You will, you will do the same thing for five children that you have. There's always one that somehow does not respond the same way. You know, not always, but you know, often. There's one that does not respond that way. But uh, you know, the way the others did. But you know the story of that, what do you call that? The guy who they had three children. And there were two that were brilliant. And the third one was a total wreck and a mess. So the husband always wanted to know whether that third child was his. <laughs> so on, when he was dying, he begged his wife, please tell me, I've always struggled with this question. <laughs> was the child, is that my child? And she put her hand on her heart and she said, before God, I promise you, that is your child. <laughs> and then he died peacefully. And then she told a friend, I didn't tell him that the other two were not his. <laughs> so, you've got to learn how to let how to let go. <laughs> well, they say, like, you know, mother is fact, father is faith. But anyway, so... <laughs> um, so learning how to let go. Learning how to let go of the outcome. Of the outcome. Okay, one other Buddhist principle is this. They say, you got to live a, you got to live a life of compassion without being attached to the outcome. I'd like you to take that down if you're taking notes and think about it. Live a life of compassion without being attached to the outcome. Without being attached to the outcome. You know, live a life of compassion and let it go. Like what happens to my students, what happens to you, what happens to your children, what happens to your loved ones. You live your life of compassion, but you cannot be attached to the outcome even though you believe it is for their good. How do you know? You know, how do you know? So anyway, um, so that's like, that's the, so the first part is uh, Panna. Panna is wisdom. The second part is Shila. Shila is character. Very often it is translated as morality or morals. But Shila is actually what makes you the person that you are. So it's not morality as like keeping the law, etc. Even though it is, it has got to do with the right speech, right action, and right livelihood. You know, but that is part of your character. That builds your character. And the last part, you know, I want to stop and give you time for conversation. Uh, the last part of this eightfold path is uh, samadhi. 
Our samadhi is spiritual repose. Spiritual repose. So it has got to do with right effort, right mindfulness, and right contemplation. Maybe I'll talk a little bit more about this last part, you know, after we have a little, like, some time for interaction. So it's about an hour, and if some of you would like to leave, just feel free to go. Uh, those of you like to have, like, some conversation, this, you know, we'll have conversations. We'll be here till about quarter to three, another half an hour, 45 minutes. Okay? All right. Any questions? We want to record the questions, though. So, Let's I don't see any hands. Uh, oh. <laughs> For the rare person who is enlightened, uh, at least most of the time, I guess that's another, sometimes it's not a constant, but for that rare person, would suffering then cease to exist? Because, you know, he's not suffering because he's always, he's learned to deal with pain, but he's not suffering. Is that suffering to go away then? Yes. Forever? Or is it if he's enlightened forever? Or? Okay. My answer is yes. And, um, Pain will continue, suffering will go ahead. Uh, you remember the story of the Zen master. The Zen master who said, you know, before enlightenment, I was depressed. After enlightenment, I'm still depressed. <laughs> so what's the difference? So before enlightenment, I was depressed and I was suffering. After enlightenment, I'm depressed, but I'm not suffering. So before enlightenment, see, after, before enlightenment, I identified myself with my depression. After enlightenment, I see myself as the sky, and my depression is this cloud. I see a depression cloud. I said, oh, depression cloud, but I'm the sky. Then you say, happy cloud, I'm the sky. I'm not the clouds, I'm the sky. So good luck, bad luck, who knows? I don't identify myself with. Now, an enlightened person, yes, will not suffer. Will an enlightened person experience pain? Yes. But suffering, no. You know. All right? Um, I'm I'm the lady who asked you the question, about, so I did return. Um, I, I, and I apologize because I missed the beginning of your talk. Um, uh, along with this gentleman, I'm still struggling with the pain idea. Uh, I, aside from mental stress, I'm talking in this instance about physical pain where you've got chronic pain. Now, I've noticed that if I focus on something other than my pain, the pain ceases for, for that time. It comes back as soon as I'm uh, back in reality, I suppose. Um, but, but what kind of, you know, I mean, how does one deal with it? The fact is, it's there, as you just said. Um, is it just that I, I l learn to live life in despite it and rather than wallowing in suffering? Don't fight it. Don't fight it. Well, that's a good question. So, you know, physical pain, like how do I, uh, how do I deal with it? So one of the things I will tell you is, um, again, I said don't fight it, journey with it. Because if you fight it, you're giving it power. If you fight it, you're giving, you're focusing on it. If you fight it, 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 it takes over your life. But if you journey with it, yes. Let me give you an example, uh, like, you know, this is uh, a Jesuit friend of mine who was like, you know, one of my, like, gurus in Ignatian spirituality. Like, he's a guy who, he was a Spaniard who read the original writings of Ignatius, like, about ten times over, and he would, he would come and sit with me, and we would have great conversations about Ignatius. Um, now, he was an architect by profession, and everybody wanted him because 
Um, he was cheap. He, like, you know. But he was like, he was brilliant. So, I'm telling you, coming to the store, that to the point of, his, of, of to, to answer your question, but this is an important part. Like, when he would go to a group of nuns and they wanted to build classrooms, he would sit with them and ask them, what's your spirituality? What's your charism? What is your, uh, what has that got to do in building bathrooms or classrooms? No, for him, the architecture would be an expression of your charism. So when you got into a classroom, you would feel Franciscan, or you would feel Jesuit, or you would feel Dominican, or you would feel Christian brother, just by sitting in a classroom. So that was his strength. He had a motorbike that he would travel, go all over the place. And one time in Bombay, he was at a, at a stoplight, and there was a car that kind of, so he got the signal and there was a car that kind of came and hit him. So he fell there and he broke his leg. So he was taken to a government hospital and the doctor who was treating him, like you know, he was in tremendous pain. Um, then of course he went to the, he was taken to the floor and the doctor was treating him for a long time. And one day the doctor told him, he said, you know father, I've done everything I can but I think we'll have to amputate your leg. And he said, okay. And he turned around and went to sleep. The doctor couldn't sleep. This was a Hindu doctor. And they became good friends. And later he came to the community and asked him, what is it in you that gives you this freedom? When I saw you at the, at the what do you call it, in the emergency room there, I've seen people in less pain and screaming and yelling, you know, and nothing wrong with that. But you, with so much pain, were so calm and peaceful. And that night, when I told you that you would have to amputate your leg, you said, okay, and you went to sleep. And he brightened up and he said, I believe that with my leg or without my leg, God loves me all the same. Now, you and I also say that. So please don't cut my leg. <laughs> it's true. If you can save the leg, save it. But if nothing can be done, let it go. And he was in constant, constant pain. And one of the things he claims that he, he got it from me, and like, I don't know, I'm saying, I don't know where I gave it, but when I, he said, you taught me that pain is all in the head. Pain is in the mind, not in the body. So he says, I just ignore the pain in the mind, and I keep going and moving. You know, of course, he could never get up on the motorbike again because of his leg. And guess what? I inherited his bike. So, <laughs> but the point of the pain, the point of the physical pain is this. I'm not saying physical pain is not real. It is real. You know, and you need to do whatever you can to lessen it or to get rid of it. You know, take painkillers, see the doctor, do every, this is, I'm not glorifying pain. No, if you have a headache, go and take an aspirin or do something to get rid of that headache. You know, do anything and everything to get rid of that. But ultimately, yes, learn to live and flow with the pain. No, easier said than done. I'm not saying no, you know, but again, pain is like what you said. Once you focus on other things, somehow your focus goes away from your physical pain and you can deal with it. You know, if you see Tuesdays with Maury, remember the book and this, you know, I love it and I still show that to my students. You know, some of my Buddhist stories are from there, you know. So Tuesdays with Maury, they asked him, you know, do you really, aren't you, how come you're always, on top. And Maury says, no, I'm not always up. I have my moments, and especially when I wake up in the morning, I cry. I cry. I say, why me? Why me? You know, why this sickness? Why am I dying? You know, and then he says, then I wake up, and then I'm thinking about the rest of the day. What he said was, he says, enough of self-pity for the day. 
Now I'm thinking about the people I'm going to meet, the people I'm going to talk to, I'm going to learn all these different things. So he's changed the focus now onto something else. You know? So as long as you can change the focus onto some other things, you say, yes, the pain is there, but I'm not going to let myself be miserable and suffer. It's, like I said, it's easier said for me than done. But that for me is a way out. You know? So if there, is, if there is pain, do something about the pain. If there's nothing you can do about the pain, we, we learn to live through it. You know that, and the focus is, you know, there, is, there was a Jesuit in India. Like we have scorpions in different places, especially when you go to the missions. And if you get stung by a scorpion, that hurts. So he would do the pencil therapy. So he would say, okay, where's the pain? So he would, they would say, here's pain. <laughs> so then he would take his pencil and make a mark like that and say, okay, here he makes a cross. He says, think about, is there pain here? No, there's no pain. Uh -huh. Then you take it, you know, so he's taken their focus out of the, the pain to where there's no pain and through their mind, he gets it out of their body. So finally, he'll come down to the, you know, to a toe, and he'll say, okay, the pain's gone. And it's gone. Now, it's brainwashing, but <laughs> it works. that's what Jesuits do. <laughs> Paul, could you please reflect for me on this? What are the similarities? I know it's a large question. What are the positive similarities between Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam, and Christianity? What can be said about all four of these? Nothing. <laughs> and what is nothing? Nothing is no thing. Nothing. What is nothing? This is thing. I yeah. is nothing. So in all the world, I alone exist, and that I is nothing. So that's the common element, common thread of all spiritual paths. It's kind of a universal interconnectedness of that which is not a thing. Oh, now, yes, you made it, thank you, that's my baby. <laughs> all right, you need, you did not need all that wisdom, you have it. Okay? But you know what, maybe at the end, I will bring all this together and see, and ask me the question again later, okay? Thank you. I had a friend who was dying of uh, pancreatic cancer. And diagnosis and that cancer uh, usually strikes in six months yes. very predictable in that six months in the first few weeks he accepted his cancer uh, and he lived every day like he had never lived before his family was all a buzz around him they were suffering he was in pain but he was not suffering he had the most complete, wonderful life in six months yeah. that I've ever experienced. It was an honor to know him. It's just my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> well, thank you for sharing that. You know, that's really, yes, so when a person, very often when a person is kind of, you know, is sick and is dying and in pain, that person is free, but everybody else is suffering for that person. Mm -hmm. You know, we identify myself, ourselves with that person and we suffer. <clears throat> you know, there's another true story of this fellow who, like, was, uh, uh, like, he had a, you know, he was given just three years to live, and he was going to die. So he went through all the same, then he started kind of, you know, yeah, he started <laughs> giving up everything that he had, like, you know, giving up anger, hatred, hurts, and material things, and he was so free. But about a year or so later, the doctors, he, he got this wonderful phone call from the doctors to say, come down, come down, we have news for you. So when he comes down there, they tell him, we found a cure. And he began to cry. He said, what am I going to do now? 
You know, I'm going to go back and revert to my old ways of accumulating stuff, holding on to anger, hurt, because I have time. But before that, I knew I had only three years. And so, yes, was he in pain? Yes. But he gave up suffering. And when they told him, there's a cure, he began to cry. Because now, he said, it's going to be a struggle getting back to my old ways. But thank you for sharing. Yes? What Kevin about that is, to me, it was accepting death, which we don't do in our culture. We deny our death from our very existence, which is the terminal disease that we're born with, which is life. And I heard on the radio just yesterday that they're going to talk about death and dying for the next three years to make this more a reality in the American culture. You know, because all the TV advertisements and everything tells us, you're not going to die. Buy this washing machine and it'll put 10 years in your life. No, it'll kill you. But it destroys your clothes. It's going to buy more clothes. It's spend on your money. You cannot live for 10 years. Every once in a while you hear that suffering will make you stronger. And I'm wondering how that ties in with what you were saying. Suffering makes you stronger. Uh, I, you know, when I reflect on my own life, yes. Like, uh, yeah, see, I'm suffering, but it's not making me stronger. <laughs> Just let me go. So. I don't believe that suffering makes us stronger, but pain does. So pain makes us stronger, suffering makes us weaker. You know, when we start suffering, then we kind of, uh, yeah, then we want somebody to carry us, lift us, like, you know, but the pain will make us stronger. Anybody else? Yes. You know, uh, I really like what you said about pain and suffering. And you know, the, the, what it brought to mind initially for me was in the Catholic Mass, we talk about Jesus suffering. He suffered and died for us. And that's a big tenet of Christianity. And I've always had a problem with that, but I kind of like the way you put it. I, I kind of think that he felt the pain, but not the suffering. You know, I, I really kind of believe that, you know. I'm, Pope might not like that, but that's kind of what I believe, you know. Uh, but the question that I wanted to ask you was, do you see any parallels between Ignatian spiritual exercises and the Buddhist, Buddhist path or other Eastern, you know, philosophies? All right. That's a great comment and a great <laughs> question and a great reflection here. You know, just to answer the first question um, about Jesus suffered for our sins, that's very colonial. That's colonial Christianity. When they went around colonizing the world and forcibly baptizing people and introducing people to the suffering Jesus. So when I grew up, the Jesus that was introduced to me was a Jesus who was born, a Jesus who died, a Jesus who never lived, and a Jesus who never rose. He was the suffering Jesus. So Christmas here we celebrated in a big way. But what did we focus on? The manger, the poverty, and all those kinds of things. We forgot about the gold, frankincense, and mother. We wonder, like, where did that gold go? <laughs> the Jesuits took it to educate the yeah. child. <laughs> So, but and the next thing that was celebrated was Good Friday and the 40 days of Lent. Oh my, those were taken very, very, very seriously. Rest, Easter Sunday came and Easter Sunday went. We never celebrated Easter. So I would be a great component of replacing every crucifix with the resurrected Jesus. Yeah. We've had enough yeah. of that, you know, enough of that, of the, because it, it is a way of control of controlling you, of putting fear, putting guilt. You know, we were raised as little children to see this is what your sins have done to Jesus, put him on the cross. No. 
My sin, Jesus was on the cross. He died for my sin. But what a sin. He was trying to tell me who I am. He gave me my identity. You know, my identity. You know, when you look at that little child, we have a Hindu mystic that tells us, every child born into this world comes with a message that God is pleased with us. Look at the child and you'll know. Look at any child. Look at every child. Yeah, see, that God is pleased with us. Every child comes into the world, but religion will not let us see that. Religion, you take that baby to be baptized, they'll exorcise it. Exorcism is part of infant baptism. You know, it's part of the ritual. Now, whenever I baptize, I always skip the exorcism and I would tell parents, Bring this child back when it's a teenager and we'll have a real exorcism. But, but, but not now. Okay? So yes, in my, in my room, in my home, I don't have the crucifix. I have the laughing Jesus. And there was one Catholic woman who was a friend of mine, came to my place and says, Boy, you're Catholic. You have to have a cross. You have to have a cross. I said, I don't need one. She says, No, you have to. I said, okay, I have one. She said, where? I said, you. <laughs> no, I don't need a cross, but I need the laughing Jesus. Whenever I take life too seriously, I look at Jesus and he goes, ha. My life's a mess. And I look at him and he says, ha. And I say, ha. And life goes on. You know, and that's much better. And if there's anything, any picture, any image we have need to have Jesus, it's the resurrected Christ, and not only the resurrected Christ, the universal cosmic Christ. You know, every Christmas we become, we follow the Freudian regression. We go back to that infant Jesus, and now with that baby Jesus, and we become, and then we don't let him grow. So Jesus has expanded. Jesus has become the, I'm, I'm the, my life is based on Jesus. But he is the cosmic Christ. So, okay, is there any, like, you know, when it comes to Ignatius, Ignatius is very Eastern. Very Eastern. He's a non-dualist. He's one that, you know, it's not one, not two. For him, ultimately, it is the rays of the sun and the sun, waters of the fountain and the fountain. So there is no fountain without water. Water has its identity only as being part of the fountain. Therefore, there is no you unless you and I find our identity in God. Ignatius doesn't believe in the white old man out there in the sky who will very lovingly and kindly tell you, go to hell. When you show up. Because they have put Peter there. You know, with a particular judgment, final judgment. That is rubbish. Rubbish. An invention to control you. Jesus did not teach us that. He taught us the father of the prodigal son. Waiting for us to show up so that God can show up. That is God of Jesus. The rest is an invention of humans. And it happens in every religion. It's not just in Christianity. In every religion. As soon as they take over religion, they, they modify the scriptures. They modify the scriptures and, you know, and give us a totally different. So thank you for asking. Okay? Yes. Oh, gee, are you going to contradict what he said? <laughs> Not at all. Uh, no, my question is, do you think that that conversion from the beginning of the religion to the, to the changing of the scriptures has more to do with political power? And uh, therefore... How, how might that be um, obviated? Well, it is being kind of changed. So it has been part of political power. In fact, in the first five centuries of the Christian tradition, there was no hell. Hell was not part of the teaching of the first five centuries. You know? And in the first five centuries, the serpent in the Garden of Eden was not equated with Satan or the devil. The serpent is a symbol of wisdom. The serpent is a pathway to enlightenment. 
says who, not me. I sat with a rabbi with, with the Hebrew text and he was, we were going line by line, word by word, and he was saying serpent wisdom, had a secret wisdom that no other creature had. When the man and woman recognized that they were naked, nakedness in Hebrew, the word means wisdom. Nakedness and wisdom have the same word, the same word, okay? And then he said, and their eyes were opened. Remember, after they ate, they followed the serpent, their eyes were opened. He translated that from his Hebrew, that they were enlightened. Now, he was having problems with his tradition and scholarship. Because even in the Jewish tradition, they have made the serpent evil, cunning, conniving. And I said, let's stay with the text. Let's look at the meaning. Let's look at the words. So he's so excited that we're going to meet again. And we're going to meet again now to read two other chapters. Chapter 1 and 2 is what I would like to, you know, chapter 2 is my favorite. Chapter 3 is pivotal. The way you understand chapter 3 will make and break Jesus. You know, the way you understand Jesus. The way you understand salvation. You know, so yes, for me, the serpent is wisdom and the whole text is very Eastern because what is sin? Ignorance and no consciousness. The serpent invited, like, you know, the Adam and Eve to greater knowledge and greater consciousness and they were enlightened and they were free. Okay, all right, yes. So what would be the spiritual significance of being thrown out of the Garden of Eden in light of eating the apple is being brought to a state of enlightenment? I can make up my own interpretation, but I wonder what's going on. What is your interpretation? What is your interpretation? Um, that we don't need to be limited by a particular time and space to have it be uh, <coughs> heaven on earth, if you will. You know, the, the, the um, well, the game example, of, you know, um, uh, hold on, we don't need to be limited by time and space to have that only be our garden that we find it inside. All right, so, I would say, okay, what is, what is the significance of being thrown out of the Garden of Eden? Um, I don't, see, the whole thing is, the whole Garden of Eden thing is a myth, okay? It's a story about, like, <clears throat> um, like what happened to humans and, so for me, the way, of, like when you're thrown out of the Garden, you're thrown out by a, by a God that is not, because the other thing I asked this, I asked the rabbi, who is this God in the Garden of Eden? And he says, oh, it is Adonai Elohim. So it is all those gods come together. He says, oh, because it's not like Adonai, that is the Eloistic God, or like, you know, uh, uh, no, Adonai, that is the Yahwistic God, or Elohim, that is the Eloistic God. So it is Adonai Elohim. So it's like all these names of God come together there. So. So I said, could it be one of the gods of the pantheon in the, in the Bible? He said, oh, no, no, there are, there's only one god in the Bible. I said, Rabbi, read Joshua chapter 24, verse 2. We'll tell you. So, you know, like our father Abraham worshipped many gods. Um, he says, you know the Bible better than I do. I said, no, I know a few verses. <laughs> and I can smack smart. I said, you know the Bible. But so he realized, okay, yes, there were many gods floating around there. So thrown out of the garden, we were thrown out by the god that was threatened. Like one of the minor gods, not the god. One of the minor gods was threatened. 